Welcome to an ultralight airplane design video for the UWS-1 Ultralight from the Ultralight Airplane Workshop. As I'm going to talk about in the slides that are coming up, we need to figure out the size for the vertical tail of the ultralight. By the time we get to the end of this sizing endeavor for the vertical tail, it'll be time to take a break from the aerodynamic design and start working on some load analysis, particularly for the vertical tail, so that we can move on to making a rudder part. We are finally getting to the part of the UWS-1 ultralight airplane design that I've really been looking forward to. And that's figuring out the service area, the size for the vertical tail. Because once I get that figured out, I can start working on aerodynamic loads for that tail, and then I can start making a rudder. And of course, making videos about the whole process. This is part one of a multi-part series. There's going to be at least two parts, maybe three or four parts, but definitely at least two parts. And those two parts will cover different ways of coming up with the surface area for the vertical tail, at least for this particular ultralight airplane. There are at least three methods for trying to come up with what the surface area should be for the vertical tail. And in this video, we're going to talk about a method using tail volume or vertical tail volume. And what you're doing in this method is using tail volume and tail volume is length multiplied by surface area size. So in this case, it would be the distance from the center of gravity of the airplane to the 25% mean aerodynamic cord of the vertical tail. You multiply those two together and it gives you a tail volume. And so what you're gonna do is find airplanes that are similar to the one you wanna design, and then you use a similar tail volume to those airplanes. And this has been a pretty traditional way for amateur airplane designers to come up with the vertical tail size because it's really the simplest to do. And it seems to be pretty effective. Now briefly, let me talk about the other two methods. One is when you have a multi-engine airplane and the engines are spread out from the center line of the airplane. In other words, you might have one out on left wing and one out on the right wing. And what you want to do is be able to continue flying the airplane with directional control when one of the motors or engines fails and the other one is at full thrust and you're at a fairly slow flying speed with your center of gravity pretty far back. That's kind of the worst case condition when you have a motor go out. And what you want to do is make that vertical tail size big enough that you can still have directional control. And there's a way to go through and calculate all that. The other way to do it, which is far more difficult, is to figure out the size of your vertical tail that would dampen out any yawing oscillation. That's more difficult to figure out because you need to know the yawing moment of the airplane. And it really ties in with some of the other stability issues like roll stability on the airplane also. So it's not a really easy mechanism, but we may end up going for it. I'll decide that later. Now part of what's going to have an influence on the vertical size of the tail is going to be the fact that back in the goals for the airplane, we wanted to keep some provision for some future fly-by-wire with redundancy. And one of the things that we can do to have some redundancy is to have twin vertical tails. So if the power or control to one of the vertical rudders fails, the other one will still have enough control authority to fly the airplane. Another factor is that I'm attaching these vertical tails, at least potentially and likely, out the edges of the horizontal stabilizer. Now we want to prevent blanketing of the rudder and as much of the vertical tail as we can. So one method would be to move it way far forward so that when we're in a deep stall, we're still getting air flowing over the vertical surface. Now I chose to kind of give it a little more of an aerodynamic shape by moving it aft a little bit past the elevator. Now that, there's two reasons for that. One is that it should increase the effective span of my horizontal stabilizer because the vertical stabilizer is going to be acting similar to a winglet on a wing that you might find on commercial airplanes and some business aircraft. So that's kind of convenient. The other thing is that 
the elevators and rudders when they're deflecting won't interfere with each other. And the last thing is that it gives me more of an arm for the tail volume that should let me make my surface area for the vertical tail a little bit smaller and save a little bit of weight. Another potential advantage, and this is a trade-off, of having the vertical tail directly behind these motors is it's going to give the vertical surface a little more control authority, a little more effectiveness. What will happen is we're going to have a faster stream of air coming off these props and hitting the, hitting the vertical tail. It increases dynamic pressure on this vertical tail. And if you remember, the lift of any flying surface is that dynamic pressure times the surface area times coefficient of lift. So if I can increase that dynamic pressure, we increase the lift, or in other words, the effectiveness. So that's a good thing. Now the drawback to that is that we're going to increase the drag because the drag is similar to lift where the drag is the dynamic pressure times the surface area times the coefficient of drag. So this prop wash will increase the drag on the tail. So there's kind of a trade off there. In particular, I wanted more effectiveness in the one engine out condition. And I'm certainly willing to give, a, give up a little bit of drag in order to get more effectiveness of this tail to give us directional control. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of the tail volume method for the vertical tail. Now here's the equation that you can use for calculating the tail volume for an airplane. It's the surface area of your vertical surface, your horizontal stabilizer and your rudder, multiplied by a length, and that's going to be distance from the CG back to the 25% aerodynamic cord of the vertical surface, divided by surface area of the wing multiplied by the span of the wing. And your result will be somewhere between 0 0.02 and 0 0.05. Most light planes fall within this range. Now Martin, in his book on modern airplane design, uses the value of 0 0.33. That seems to be a fairly common value, a fairly average value for light planes. And so since the surface area is what we're trying to figure out, we use this volume multiplied by the wing surface area, the wingspan, divided by the arm that we just talked about up here. Now another reference that I've looked at uses 0 0.33. 3, 4, so roughly the same value. There's two places that this you can find this information. The more basic reference is light airplane design from Pesmani, uh, but I initially found it in light plane designer's handbook from Evans. Well, let's find out what we need for the UWS-1 ultralight airplane. This is a screenshot that I took from OpenVSP, which I've been using to come up with the geometry for the UWS-1 ultralight airplane. And so we have the wing already figured out, and we figured out the horizontal tail. And so right now, this is kind of how I'm thinking the horizontal tail will be in relation to the vertical tail. And so all we need to do is use the probe facility of OpenVSP to figure out this distance. So this is roughly the CG. This is roughly the 25% mean aerodynamic cord of the vertical tail, and that turns out to be 10 and 1 quarter feet. So 10 feet, 3 inches. A little over 3 meters. Oh, and by the way, kind of ignore all the rest of this that is in a wire mesh. This is just a rough guess, or in most cases, a placeholder for things I'm going to be working on in the future. This fuselage is probably not right. It'll probably be a little bit longer out here in front. The Landing gear and the landing leg are definitely not right. Those, those are just placeholders. And basically to help me do some drag estimations. And this engine nacelle, I have no idea what its shape is going to be. I just, it's just a placeholder. And these props will probably have to move back a little bit also. And so its position is just a placeholder for now. Because So the only things that have been designed, like I said before, are the wing and horizontal tail, and we're working on vertical tail. All the rest of this is going to have to be fit in a little bit later. So we can pull some numbers from previous design videos, and the number we just got from this length, and we can calculate a vertical surface area. Let's talk briefly about how these values affect the vertical tail surface area, and why it kind of makes sense. Let's go with the span a little bit first. If you increase the span, that's going to increase your surface area of the vertical tail. And that kind of makes sense. 
Most airplanes have ailerons out on their wingtips. The more you increase the span, the further those ailerons will be out, and the more moment arm they're going to have with adverse yaw. And you use your vertical tail to counter adverse yaw. So that's why it makes sense that when you increase the span, you also have to increase the vertical tail surface. Well, what about the distance, how far back that vertical tail surface is? Well, the farther back it is, the more effective it will be. Or if you want to have the same effectiveness, you can decrease the surface area. And so the larger this denominator is, the smaller this value is. The farther back you move that vertical tail, the smaller surface area you can make of the vertical tail. So that makes sense. One reason that increasing the wing surface area will require an increase in the vertical tail surface area is when you increase that surface area of the wing, you're creating a lot more weight out away from the fuselage. And that weight is going to have momentum. And if you start yawing, the more momentum out there, the more difficult it is going to be to stop that yawing. And so in order to stop it, you need a more effective tail vertical surface area. So this equation makes sense. So if we take surface area of 90.5 square feet, which we've got back from the wing design videos, and a span of 27 feet, and this 10 and a quarter feet, which we just got in the previous slide, multiply all that together and we get almost 8 square feet, about 7.9 square feet. And since we have two rudders, we cut it in half and it gives us roughly 4 square feet. Now we have to take into account that we have two wing tips. <clears throat> Whereas with a rudder, which would be usually attached to a fuselage, and that fuselage would help act kind of like an end plate so we'd only have one wing tip on the rudder unless of course you had a teeth tail we're going to have a little more loss since we have two tips we have to deal with our effective span is going to be a little bit less and in order to still maintain the same lift we would probably have to increase our surface area just a little bit but for now I'm going to go ahead and stick with this value and then later I might do some more calculations if one of the other methods doesn't come up with a bigger surface area and add a little bit more in. So for now we're going to work with this four square feet per vertical tail. I happen to have the plans for an ultra cruiser so let's go through and estimate surface area for the tail and the wing and the span for the wing and come up with whatever the vertical tail surface area should be based on what I see from the plans. Now, when I did the calculation based on the plans, I came up with almost 106 square feet. Uh, you get 101 from the website, and I think that may be because they're not including the wing tips. And same thing with the span. I came up with 24 and a half, and they had 22 and a half feet for the span. And again, I think that's just because they left off the wing tips. And the distance from the GC, or 25% cord of the wing, back to the 25% cord of the vertical tail is around nine and a quarter feet. So if we go and plug all these values in like we just did in the previous slide, we come out with 9.24 square feet. But if you use the website numbers, you come up with 8.1 square feet. How does it compare with the surface area for the vertical tail that we see on the plans? And unless I somehow made a mistake, I'm coming out with just a little over four and a half square feet. So it's quite a bit less than using this tail volume of 0.33. I did the same calculation using a tail volume of 0.02. And if you remember before, we said a range of 0.02 to 0.05 should be workable. So using 0.02 and using the website values, I ended up with a value of about 4.65 or so. The value they're using here is still within the range of reasonable values for the vertical tail volume. They used 0.02, and of course, there are plenty of examples of ultra cruisers flying, so it appears to work. So we at least have a first cut now on what the surface area needs to be for our vertical tail. But it may not be big enough. When we have an engine out condition, when we have two engines out on the wings, it's possible that that surface area we just calculated is not going to be big enough to handle that thrust from one side of the airplane. 
Now, if we were a tractor or pusher configuration with one engine at the fuselage close to the center line, we wouldn't have to worry about this. We would already have our vertical tail size and we could move on with the design. But since we have two engines out on the wings, we're going to have to calculate how much service area we need on that vertical tail to counter the thrust of one engine going full power and the other one doing nothing except creating more drag. So that'll be the part two of this video.